Well, it's, it, it's a pleasure and, and actually real honor to be here. If I gave this talk last month, it would have a picture of the Yale Bulldog up there. But uh, my, my, my allegiances are changing. I want to thank him and the organizing committee for inviting me here. And it's uh, great to see so many people interested in, in, uh, in Graves' disease. Um, I've run the Pediatric Thyroid Center at Yale, which actually was the first pediatric thyroid center uh, in the country. And uh, uh, now other places are starting to mimic that model because subspecialization for kids, just as it's happened in adults, is uh, uh, really important. Let me ask here, who um, um, have, are you the, hold, hold this closer. All right, can you hear okay? All right, thank you. Uh, uh, who here have children that have Graves' disease? So, that, so that's a lot, okay. Um, how, um, without giving away too much medical information, how old are your kids? 16? Seven. Seven? 40. 40? Okay. <laughs> My definition of a kid is when they keep asking their parents for money. <laughs> that's, for, that's forever. <laughs> All right. Well, so today I'll talk, first I also want to point out that there are a lot of different ways to do things in medicine. And the approach that I talk about doesn't mean that this is the right approach. And it may differ than what your doctor is doing. So, uh, uh, you know, so, so recognize that, but this is the approach and uh, things that have, that have worked for me. So first about Graves' disease. Um, as you know, it's the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. In adults, it happens at about one in a thousand individuals, but in kids, it's uh, a lot less common. About one in 10,000 children have Graves' disease. And similar to adults, uh, more girls are affected with Graves' disease than our boys. And as you know, this is the endocrine disease of the American presidency. Uh, when George Bush was president, he developed Graves' disease. Then his wife Barbara developed Graves' disease. And then the dog Millie developed Graves' disease. Why are you clapping? Because Millie had Graves' disease. I know cats that have Cats, yeah, that's right. And, uh, and all three were actually treated with, uh, with, with radioactive iodine. Uh, is, there are some important differences between Graves' disease in children than adults. Uh, first, children have lower remission rates than adults do. And by what we mean by remission, that is the individual uh, has normal thyroid hormone levels while not taking any of the antithyroid medications like PTU or methimazole. And at best, the remission rates are between 15 and 30 percent for boys and girls who have Graves' disease. This is after years of treatment. The other thing that we find is that the younger a child is when they get Graves' disease, the less likely that this will ever go away. So in our, co in our group of uh, boys and girls who have Graves' disease, who've got at less than five years of age, uh, we've only had one child of all the kids that we've cared for uh, where it has ever gone away. So if somebody gets Graves' disease when they're young, the chance that it'll go away on its own is very, very slim. And this has been shown in other studies, Dorothy Schulman's group in Florida, and Leora Lazar and Moshe Phillips in Tel Aviv. They also, uh, also find that. There are some things that we can try to do in terms of personalizing the treatment approaches. So whenever I see a boy or a girl uh, or an adolescent with Graves' disease, I try to say, are they likely to go into remission? Or are they unlikely to go into remission? Because if they're very unlikely to go into remission, then we can have a conversation really in the very beginning about talking on about definitive treatment, either surgery or radioactive iodine, as a potential initial treatment option. So if the thyroid gland is small or normal size, you're more likely to go into remission uh, as compared to whether it's large or not. There are antibodies that attack the thyroid gland that stimulate the thyroid gland to be overly active. These are called thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins or TSIs. If they are in the normal range, you have a chance of going into remission. But if at initial presentation in children, if they're elevated, the chance of going into remission after long-term treatment is going to be fairly low. And also, older kids are more likely to go into remission than the younger kids. 
So what this means is that most boys and girls are going to eventually need either radioactive iodine or surgery. And I understand that we had a talk yesterday from Dr. Avram about radioactive iodine, and Dr. Miller will speak about surgery later on, and Dr. Woods uh, commented on this earlier. There are three treatment options for Graves disease, surgery, medical therapy, and radioactive iodine. Actually, a Nobel Prize was awarded for, uh, for surgery to Coker from Bern, Switzerland in the early 1900s. Uh, the antithyroid medications, uh, there's actually, Boston's a really rich town for thyroidology history. Uh, actually, the first clinical trial of antithyroid medications uh, was performed by Astwood, who I believe is at Tufts uh, Medical Center in the 1940s. And then also, radioactive iodine as a therapy for Graves' disease started at the Massachusetts General Hospital by uh, Hertz and, uh, and Chapman. And I should also point out that uh, uh, Mass General is, uh, is actually where I uh, did, had all my medical training, and it's just a wonderful institution. Uh, so as far as medical therapy, there are two medications, uh, propylthiouracil or PTU or methimazole. So let me ask for a show of hands uh, for the parents who have their kids on thyroid medications. Um, which ki uh, uh, who is children that are, that are taking methimazole? Okay, uh, what about uh, PTU? All right, is anybody in the room on PTU? All right, good, and you'll see why. Uh, so historically, uh, historically PTU has been used much more than methimazole, really up until about four or five years ago. And if you read some of the classic pediatric textbooks that are out there now, you'll actually see they actually talk about, uh, about PTU. Part of this has to do with the Mass General Hopkins thing. So at Mass General, if they used methimazole, Johns Hopkins would recommend PTU. Uh, Mass General would recommend dexamethasone for some diseases. Hopkins would recommend uh, hydrocortisone. So um, it's interesting. And in 2008, uh, when our group discovered the major safety alert with PTU, which was there that was hidden, uh, there were actually nearly 3,000 kids in the U.S. Uh, who were actually taking PTU. And uh, uh, this came to light uh, about two, three years ago, received a lot of attention. Uh, here's from USA Today. You know, doctors say thyroid drugs can hurt liver, be fatal for, uh, be fatal for kids. And this actually came about uh, and, um, in, the, in May 2008. I was giving a talk at the pediatric meetings. Uh, there were about 1,000 pediatric endocrinologists there and were speaking about Graves' disease. And after my talk, uh, some of my colleagues came up to me and told me about some kids that had recently had problems related to PTU. I learned about a girl who was 15 years of age uh, who had a liver transplant um, out on the West Coast. A nine-year-old girl out in California who had a liver transplant. Um, an eight-year-old girl in Texas who had, had a liver transplant. So I came back from the meeting, sat down on my computer, and just typed in uh, propylthiouracil death, propylthiouracil liver failure, and all this information was there. We then got this to the FDA and to the National Institutes of Health, and, uh, and then on October 28th, we actually had hearings in Washington under the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children's Act umbrella. And uh, uh, there were thyroidology experts there, uh, experts in liver failure, organ transplantation. It was really a tremendous meeting. But this, I think, was actually probably the most telling of all the data that were presented. And this is from the United Network of Organ Sharing that keeps track on liver transplants. And it turns out that PTU, even though it's a rarely prescribed medication, was actually the fourth most common cause of liver transplants related to drugs in children. And over a 14-year period, there were 10 PTU-related liver transplants. So what this means is that every four years, three kids were having a liver transplant. I think that's absolutely horrible. And there's no other drug on the market that his, this degree of liver uh, uh, toxicity. And at the same time, no cases were found with uh, methimazole. 
And after the meeting, Don Madison, who was chief of the uh, Best Pharmacool Pharmaceuticals for Children's Act branch, and I, uh, we sat down and we wrote uh, first a report, and then it got trimmed down to a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, which basically said ending propylthiouracil induced liver failure in children. And in this, we actually had some very specific recommendations, and that is PTU should never be used as first-line therapy in, in boys and girls. It should only be used in rare situations, such as preparation for surgery, patient who's developed an allergic reaction to methimazole, or in pregnancy, and that PTU use in children should actually be stopped in favor of alternative therapies. So at the time we did this, there were about 3,000 kids in the U.S. who were taking PTU. So the, with the different endocrine societies, we sent off uh, email alerts to get things uh, uh, known. Also, the FDA actually sent out some recommendations, which were very similar to what uh, Don Madison and I had published. And uh, finally, uh, about two years after we started uh, uh, this journey trying to get uh, information out about this, the FDA finally issued a boxed warning, and basically it says uh, what were in our uh, recommendations, that PTU should really be reserved for very special circumstances in the pediatric population. What's, the box? What's that? What's the box? Yeah, so what a boxed warning is, is that this is a special safety alert that uh, in the package insert, it's a black box which says, attention physicians, do not use this drug <laughs> because of these particular uh, uh, potential, uh, potential side effects. So what do we do now? Well, so we're really left with one drug, methimazole, uh, and that's good to see that folks in the audience um, have their uh, uh, children on methimazole. Uh, as far as methimazole, uh, uh, it's a the small tablets, they're actually smaller than PTU, and even though some physicians will prescribe methimazole many times a day, there's ample published data to show that just once a day is all that you need. It's as effective as if you give it twice a day. And the more that we have experience with methimazole and other groups, uh, uh, and some of this has been published, um, we see side effects with these medications. And I'm more and more convinced that the side effects are related to doses. So what we try to do is use low doses. Uh, they come in 5 milligram or 10 milligram tablets, which can be cut. And the rule of thumb we go by is we try to use a dose that's close to the child's age and years. Some people think if you use higher doses, you'll get the child to go into remission quicker. Uh, that may happen to some extent, but not, not really that much. And the side effects happen more over the first three months. And the children who have Graves' disease, they've been hyperthyroid for a while and there's no rush to try to normalize things immediately. So we start off with low doses, and then we go slowly uh, with just uh, once a day. But methimazole is absolutely no angel. These antithyroid medications have been on the market for more than 60 years. We've had no new antithyroid products on the market for more than six decades. And uh, there is toxicity with methimazole. So when we looked at our last 100 consecutive kids who were treated with methimazole, we find that almost 20% have minor side effects, rashes, hives, joint aches. And then we've had children who've had major side effects uh, where we've actually had to hospitalize kids. And shown in red uh, are uh, two of our patients who had a condition called Steven Johnson syndrome. And what this is, you get severe blisters all over your bodies, sores in your mouth, and this actually is a life-threatening uh, uh, condition. So if you have a child who's on methimazole, you have a one in five chance that the child is gonna have a side effect. That's gonna be mild. Um, and their child is gonna probably have about a two in 100 chance of actually having a major side effect. So whenever we start uh, patients on methimazole, we always caution families about that. If a child has a fever, gets a rash, gets muscle aches, hives, 
immediately stop the medication, contact your physician, and uh, start considering other, uh, other therapies. So what do you do if you have a side effect? Well, you have to start talking about surgery or radioactive iodine. Again, most boys and girls are going to require this. And PTU really should not be used for long-term therapy. The risk of developing liver failure leading to transplantation or death um, is about one in a thousand in children. Actually, after we published our New England Journal uh, letter, we actually became aware of even more cases that, uh, uh, that actually made us think that the risk was actually higher than actually we thought of, that we presented at these meetings. So another area of controversy is uh, how long to treat. So there are nice data, prospective studies, meaning that they follow patients from the time of enrollment uh, up until the end of the study in adults. Um, that suggests that if you're treated for more than a year and a half with antithyroid medications, uh, that's about uh, how long you're going to be able to be treated for to increase your chance of going into remission. So extending it for two years, three years, four years, five years, six years is not going to increase the chance that um, you're not going, that this is going to go away. And the data in pediatrics are, are similar. Uh, the largest study came from Joel Hamburger uh, at the University of Minnesota who followed 262 children some of whom were on antithyroid medications for up to 10 years. And what he found was that overall, there was only a 14% chance that the Graves' disease went away. Nicole Glazer and Dennis Stein in a Northern California collaborative um, again found that at best, they saw about a 24% remission rate, meaning that the Graves' disease goes away in these individuals and that with treatment extended beyond two years did not make a difference. And then in the only prospective study of its type, the group from uh, France, um, they found that after two years they saw about a 28 uh, percent remission rate and um, they are following these individuals uh, uh, longer as well. So at the present time, does data either in children or in adults support the notion that there's an increased chance of remission uh, beyond one to two years of antithyroid drugs? The answer to that is no. But is it okay to do so? Sure. Uh, sometimes parents aren't ready to move on to definitive therapy. Sometimes we want the child to become a little bit older until we think that they may be a better candidate for radioactive iodine or for surgery. But I do want to point out that if you're on antithyroid medications, methimazole, um, long-term, uh, toxic side effects can occur at any time and they can happen, uh, they can happen suddenly. And uh, we sort of have become a repository uh, for anything bad that can happen to a child in the United States on an antithyroid medication we typically hear about. And um, there are many examples uh, of individuals who've been on methimazole two years, three years, four years, who all of a sudden have a severe reaction to these medications that can be quite serious. Um, so my feeling is, you know, once you're past the two-year mark, if you're not going into remission, I really view the risks of the medication as being greater than the risks of being on the um, uh, then moving on to definitive therapy. The other thing that happens is sometimes the thyroid gland can increase in size um, and if this happens we've taken care of boys and girls who were good candidates for radioactive iodine to now where they have to have surgery because radioactive iodine um, does not work if the gland is very very uh, large. As far as surgery which I know Dr. Miller will speak about, where's Dr. Miller? There you are, okay. Next, um, there are a couple of approaches. One is you leave a little bit of thyroid tissue behind. This is called a subtotal thyroidectomy. And the thought here being that if you leave some tissue behind, you won't have to take a replacement thyroid hormone later on. Um, or you try to take out the entire thyroid gland, which is either a near total and a total thyroidectomy. And what is generally recommended is to do a near total or a total thyroidectomy. 
because if you do a subtotal thyroidectomy, the recurrence rate is actually high. So actually what we do at Yale, we do a, we do a total capsular thyroidectomy. We do not leave any thyroid tissue behind uh, except in unusual circumstances, and we have a zero uh, relapse rate. Uh, Dr. Wood talked about this earlier, who should be operating. So uh, uh, there is a very prominent uh, thyroid surgeon out in California named Orlo Clark, and he published a, uh, a commentary in a very prestigious endocrinology journal, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, saying that surgery is the optimal treatment for uh, Graves' disease in pediatric patients. And he said that there's a 1% to 2% uh, complication rate with this. But is this true? Well, it may be true for Dr. Clark operating on his adult patients. He's an expert endocrine surgeon, and there's no question that thyroid surgery in adults is uh, uh, not as challenging as is thyroid surgery in, in children. So Julianne Souza is one of the endocrine surgeons at Yale, and we work together to actually look at what are the data for this. Uh, so one of the things that we've really tried to do systematically with our program at Yale is really try to find data to really address these, uh, uh, these issues. So we were able to get outcome data for more than 1,000 uh, thyroid operations in the United States. There are databases where you can look at. And then we actually looked at what are the complication rates to see if what Dr. Clark said was true. And it turns out if you're operated on by a pediatric surgeon, the chance of a major complication, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, having permanent damage to the glands that regulate your calcium metabolism. These are called the parathyroid glands. It's about 20%, about one in five. If your child is operated on by a general surgeon, it's 12%. And if you're operated on by a high volume thyroid surgeon, and by high volume, it's defined as doing more than 50 cases a year, um, it's about 4%. So this is, at, this is higher than what has been reported for the adult complications, even by the high volume surgeon. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah, so this would be a thyroid endocrine, uh, a thyroid endocrine surgeon, typically. So, so, you know, even at the busiest children's hospitals, they, uh, the, the pediatric surgeons probably do less than four or five cases a year. We probably do as much thyroid surgery at Yale as any other place in the country. Our adult surgeons do about 1,200 thyroidectomies a year. Uh, but in terms of pediatrics, we, we probably are one of the busier centers. We, we do two to eight cases a month versus more than 120 cases a month. Uh, there just is not that much thyroid surgery. So, um, so, so based on this, uh, these are recommendations that have actually come up in the consensus guidelines for the American Thyroid Association, uh, where I was the uh, pediatric representative. And uh, what we say is that children should be cared for by high volume thyroid surgeons, those who do more than 30 cases a year. Now. Uh, I mentioned there's very little thyroid surgery. So surgery and very few pediatric surgeons do that many cases a year. Our pediatric surgeon does, um, but he operates in, in tandem with our chief of surgery. So we have two surgeons in the case operating on these patients. So we get pediatric experience and we have uh, adult experience. Uh, that said, their uh, surgery is not going to be optimal for many, many children in the United States. And uh, last year, I attended the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Organization. I spoke to the pediatric uh, subgroup, and the parents of all these kids who were operated on, every, every kid who was operated on had a major complication. And they're operated on by pediatric surgeons. It's interesting surgery, they like to do it, but it's like everything else, experience matters. 
So due to the scarcity of pediatric endocrine surgeons, um, of which there are very, very few, is what uh, uh, was suggested and we suggest is that you have a multidisciplinary approach where basically either the pediatric surgeon or if the high volume adult thyroid surgeon feels comfortable, um, really should optimally be operating on these individuals. This actually places a lot of pediatric endocrinologists in conflict at their institution because they'll send the patients out, they'll send them to the adult side, and then the pediatric surgeons hear that they sent cases away. And uh, so you really have to advocate. So as I mentioned, the model we came up with at Yale, and I believe we're the only place in the country uh, which does that, and we'll soon be doing this in Florida, uh, is that we'll have a pediatric surgeon with thyroid expertise operating in tandem with a high volume adult surgeon. And we've just reviewed our last 100 consecutive cases, and um, we've had absolutely, we've had no permanent injuries. And when we actually compare it to the adult data, we see some interesting differences that uh, with adults, we do see some individuals will actually have some rebleeding. When the thyroid gland is removed, the surgeons will tie off six arteries in four veins. And in uh, some adults, uh, we actually will see some rebleeding. So at, when we operate on our pediatric patients, um, uh, we watch them over the next uh, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, uh, they actually go to our intensive care unit where they get one-on-one -on -one nursing, and then they go home the, the next morning. As far as radioactive iodine, uh, uh, the, the history again starts in Boston. And one of the things that I learned about uh, relatively uh, recently was when I did my training, I was always taught that Earl Chapman at the general was the person who started this. But uh, a summer ago, I was contacted by a woman named Barbara Hertz, who was the daughter of somebody named Saul Hertz. And he was somebody that was at Mass General Hospital uh, was there for a period of time, went in the military, and uh, he was actually the first person to use radioactive iodine, um, but uh, other people took credit for it. And these are actually uh, the case series of the first patients who had been treated with radioactive iodine for Graves disease um, at, uh, at Mass General. And um, these were um, in the early 1940s, and he actually published these um, in the 1950s. As far as the goal of treatment, just like surgery, you want to get the entire thyroid gland out. With radioactive iodine, the goal is to completely wipe out the entire thyroid gland. Some people have tried to come up with a dose that allows you to have your thyroid still functioning, but that's too hard to predict. The rate of recurrence ends up being too high. And in a child, that will leave behind partially irradiated thyroid tissue, which will make a risk of malignancy. So what we believe, and other people have advocated uh, long before us, is that you give a, a high enough dose to actually wipe out the thyroid gland. Now, we're giving children radioactive iodine. Uh, you know, we're talking about cancer and all kinds of fears, reproductive effects. So really, what are the data for this? And maybe you went into this yesterday. I'm sorry I wasn't here for your presentation. I, had, I was seeing patients. In terms of thyroid cancer, the thyroid gland is a radioactive sensitive gland. If a thyroid gland is exposed to radioactivity and you are young and your thyroid gland remains intact, this increases your risk for developing thyroid cancer later on. And in fact, in the early days of radioactive iodine therapy, when they really weren't sure what doses should be used, we actually found that children treated for thyroid cancer, I mean, I'm sorry, children treated for Graves' disease um, would develop nodules and some developed thyroid cancers. But now we are wiser and if children are treated with the doses that will wipe out the thyroid glands, uh, we are not aware of any cases of thyroid cancer that have developed in children who've been treated with what is the currently recommended dose. Now this sometimes is a problem because nuclear medicine people will say, gosh, you know, we're treating this, uh, this 10 year old girl with radioactive iodine. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable giving radioactive iodine to a 10 year old girl. 
So instead of giving her the 15 millicuries that we calculate that she needs, we'll give her seven. So what this ends up resulting is in is a child where a treatment is not going to be effective. She's going to be left with partially irradiated thyroid tissue, and then uh, the individual needs to be treated again. And I would say at least every other week, I get an email from one of my colleagues, a different part of the country, saying, will you please speak with our person in our nuclear medicine department? So when you, these doses are calculated, it has nothing to do with the age of the child. It has nothing to do with the gender of the child. It all has to do with the size of the gland and how active that gland is. Um, so if thyroid cancer is not going to be an issue because if you treat properly, there will not be any thyroid tissue left to develop uh, malignancies. Uh, how I frame the discussion is the rest of the body radiation exposure. Because when you take a capsule of radioactive iodine, you will get, it'll pass through your body and gets eliminated uh, in the urine. And there will be some low level whole body radiation exposure. And there is no such thing as a safe radi radiation exposure for anything, whether it's the radon in your homes, whether it's a flight over uh, uh, the transatlantic. Uh, radiation is all around us. And uh, uh, the current models are there's no such thing as a threshold effect. Your risk of cancer is only higher if you're above a certain level. It's thought to be a gradual um, increase. But these risks, though, can be very, very small. And uh, so this has been looked at in adults in a large number of studies involving tens of thousands of individuals. And if you look at um, the collective data, uh, it's very uh, fair to say that there's absolutely no evidence of an increased risk of cancer deaths uh, or cancers associated with radioactive iodine with the treatment of adults. So these data actually look very good. Now what about children? Uh, there have not been a large number of studies in children um, to address this issue. So we actually worked at, with individuals at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Pat Zanzonico, and individuals at the National Cancer Institute to be able to come up with what are going to be the theoretical risks um, for this. And uh, we've actually been able to do modeling, and this is actually included in the American Thyroid Association hyperthyroidism uh, uh, guidelines, and where we've actually tried to say what is somebody's potential risk. Uh, what's known based on radiation biology, if you're exposed to a certain amount of radiation, this can increase your chance of developing a cancer lifelong by X percentage. And uh, so at 60 years of age, which would be in the bottom panel here, if you look at what the relative risk is, that would be 1.02, very low. Same at 40, same at 20, same at 15. But when we start getting to 10 and younger, then we start seeing things jump up. Oh, excuse me. So based on these theoretical calculations, uh, what we recommend is try to avoid radioactive iodine in children less than five years of age, and that between five and 10, children can be treated, but that is if the calculated dose is not going to be that high. And by the calculated dose, I'm saying that you know, it has to do with how big the gland is, how active the gland is. So if you have a child that has a really big gland, you know, uh, who's seven years of age, they may need a high dosage. So we may not prefer it in this situation. But if they have a relatively small gland that's active, then they may only need five to seven millicuries. Then we'll go ahead. And I do want to point out that this is theoretical, but this is what we have to go by. And so um, how are we addressing this? We actually have a grant from the National Institutes of Health and from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration where after children are being treated with radioactive iodine, they come back the next day and then four days later, we get a blood sample, we do a whole body scan to actually look at where uh, the radioactive iodine goes and what is going to be uh, the risks. And these studies are, these studies are ongoing. Uh, so 
Um, so as far as, so in terms of summing things up, yes, ma'am. Yeah, in terms of, so the question is, you know, how many children are being treated with radioactive iodine less than 10? So first of all, 80% uh, of individuals who get Graves' disease are older than 10 years of age. So we're only dealing with a small subset of population uh, within that. And at the present time, we don't have a registry to answer that question. When I've done meetings, gone to meetings, and I've done a show of hands, uh, um, I do this all the time when I speak to when I speak to my colleagues. Um, certainly, there. So uh, the last meeting I went to was the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology about six weeks ago in Glasgow, and when I asked for children treated less than five years of age, probably out of 500 people, uh, three or four hands went up. Um, and then between five and ten years of age, I would say probably about five to ten percent of the treating endocrinologists had had done that. But I, I can't. I can't give you exact numbers more than a, than a show of hand. So we have a very skewed population, because we end up having. We probably see the most, some of the more complicated thyroid cases in the United States. So our experience is skewed, and uh, of the kids that we operate on, 80 percent come from out of state. And these are typically these young little kids who've had side effects to antithyroid medications have big, and have big glands. But for the kids between 5 and 10 that we're following uh, that have not gone into, into remission, uh, we t what we typically do is we'll stop the antithyroid medications during the school vacation over the summer. And if they aren't in remission, and they've been on antithyroid medications for a couple years, 90% um, of those kids will move on to radioactive iodine therapy if the gland is not too big. Yes? So are there any long-term studies of radioactive iodine with the dose now currently that we want to use for these children? Yeah. So uh, Charlie Reed, uh, who is an endocrinologist who trained at Mass General, then went out to the Midwest, uh, published a study uh, which had follow up for almost four decades. And uh, the, the. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and he found that there were uh, no problems long term related to either cancer risk, reproductive things, or, um, or other issues. And again, the, the amount of radioactivity is actually it's, it's very low. The whole body radi radiation exposure is very low. So if there is a risk, it probably is less than our ability to be able to detect that. Um, even thyroid cancer, so we take care of boys and girls who have thyroid cancer who get treated with doses that are 10 to 20 times higher than what we are using. And we are working with a group at the INSERM in France that actually has the largest group of children that can follow long term. So they have almost 600 boys and girls who've had thyroid cancer, some treated with radioactive iodine, 200 millicuries. Um, with, for Graves' disease, we may use 10 or 15 or 20 millicuries compared to individuals who are not. And they do not see an increase of any problems related in the kids who've had the radioactive iodine related to the radioactive iodine therapy with doses that are 10 times higher than what we are using now. Sure. So um, the eye disease and, um, is something which is a concern. So first of all, for eye disease in pediatric patients, it occurs much less commonly than in adults. And when it occurs, it's actually much milder. And there's one study where I looked at this in 100 kids, and they saw no worsening of eye disease. And we actually follow this regularly in our pediatric patients and we have not seen worsening in eye disease. We've only had one patient of all the kids we treated with radioactive iodine who ended up have worsening of their eye disease. And this was a girl who uh, actually had uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Dr. Wood had mentioned that it can be associated with other uh, autoimmune disorders. She had radioactive iodine when she was 15, 
And then when she was 25, her eye disease uh, uh, flared up at that point. So in terms, so it's, what happens with kids with the radioactive iodine and eye disease, it's different than what happens um, um, in adults. It's milder, uh, it's less common. When it occurs, it's milder. And uh, we do not see worsening of the eye disease with radioactive iodine. In situations where there is profound eye disease, what we will do is give steroids, uh, which are anti-inflammatory agents, something called prednisone, and we will do that for, um, uh, for approximately six weeks, the same protocols that are used, uh, that are used uh, in, in adults. Yes? Right. So I'll answer the last part first. That's right. So in terms of uh, why does it happen later, so for most autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases in children, they typically occur in the teenage years, whether that's autoimmune liver disease, whether it's diabetes mellitus, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, and the same applies for hyperthyroidism. It just, when puberty occurs, these autoimmune diseases will come out more then. Then as the first part of the question, how do we calculate the dose? It's based on the size of the gland, which can be estimated clinically, or sometimes with the big glands, we will use ultrasound, which can be uh, quite precise. And then we do something which is called an uptake or a tracer, where you give a small amount of radioactivity, and then the individual comes back the next day and you look at how active the gland is. And then there's a special equation where you plug in the gland size, how active the gland is, what your desired dose is um, to actually come up with what the um, dosage of the radioactive iodine should, should be applied. Uh, we do that. Um, some other places won't do that. They'll just give everybody the same dose across the board. Uh, in the adult population, uh, studies have shown that if you give everybody, let's say, 15 or 20 millicuries versus calculated, the outcome ends up being uh, the same. Uh, one of my goals is we try to give, I don't want to give too much, I don't want to give too little, and so this is a way that we actually think actually can actually lead to a lower dosage being needed than what would typically be given. So we recommend doing the calculations, but not every place, uh, not every place does that um, with that. So, oh yeah. Sure, what time is that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so, I, so I'll finish up right here. Um, so, so in terms of how we approach uh, our, our patients, uh, we try to break, the, break them down to patients that have a greater chance of remission versus a lower chance. Those individuals with a lower chance are individuals who are younger, have big thyroid glands. If the gland is really big, we recommend surgery right off the bat. Uh, then uh, if that's not the case, uh, we'll offer uh, even the parents with a low chance of remission. We find most of our patients want to go on a trial of antithyroid medication because some of these kids will go into remission. We do this for a year or two. And then uh, during the school vacation, we stop. And if the child relapses, then we typically will move on to radioactive iodine and, uh, uh, or surgery. And we really reserve surgery for the young kids who we view as being too young for radioactive iodine or parents who don't feel comfortable uh, with, with uh, radioactive iodine or the large glands. And then the other alternative is uh, resuming uh, methimazole treatment. But uh, again, uh, we believe that option A is really preferred because we really have seen problems um, that have popped up after two, three, four, five years of therapy with uh, a treatment with methimazole. So 
in terms of summing things up, uh, we really have to be, you know, it's nice to be methodical about this. We need not to fall victim to unproven assumptions which really litter um, our field. Assumptions that have been that PTU is better than methimazole. Indefinite treatment is fine. Surgery is an optimal treatment. Radioactive iodine should not be used in PTU is preferred in pregnancy. But we now know that methimazole clearly is preferable to PTU. Prolonged treatment does not result in remission. Surgery is optimal only if it's done by a high volume surgeon and that we can use radioactive iodine in children. So. Um, these are the, some of the folks that helped us, and um, <laughs> this is Albert the Alligator. That's the Florida mascot. And we have some people from Gainesville, yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so listen, if you have any other questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. And again, thank you so much. It's really terrific to be here. Thank you for your invitation.